So we're very excited, Fran, to have you here today. And I'm not going to keep this... This is not technical. This is just a personal conversation that we're having because I think one of the things that people don't know about their teachers is who they are. You know, what made you go into heart surgery? <laughs> because I, I loved it. I gave a year to <clears throat> being an internist, year of my training. There was a year of my training in orthopedics because I was an athlete, I had so many injuries, I wanted to know more about it. But it wasn't the same excitement as doing cardiac surgery. Yeah. And during my training, there was a lot of cardiac surgery that we had to be involved with. So um, that's how I ended up there. And then yeah. after about, about 15 years of doing all the things that you can do with cardiac surgery, I decided that there had to be a better way, especially with the most frequent operation that's done, which is coronary bypass. Just had to be a better way. So how were we going to be able to make it better? And then lo and behold, during the same time period when I was thinking this, the robot got okayed by the Food and Drug Administration as something that we could use, which was, I think, 2005. Yeah. So since then, I've been doing, I was very excited. There was not a whole lot of people to help you learn back in the day. Yeah. I was pretty much learning in small increments because this is a mission. It was a mission to make things easier for the patient, make the surgery easier, have better outcomes you know, the patients wouldn't have the complications that they have with the traditional way. So it was a mission. Make the patients get through easier. And, uh, but since there was really essentially nobody that could teach at the time, I sort of had to l learn in small increments. Like I take, you know, for instance, doing beating heart surgery. I did a lot of beating heart surgery before, you know, knowing that the operation for minimum for coronary bypass with the robot, it's using the robot, but it's also doing beating heart surgery. So a lot of young surgeons don't do a lot of beating heart surgery. So I thought that that was the easiest thing to learn and be, you know, very good at before I started working with the robot. And then I started using the robot doing small little parts of the operation at a time, and then going back to uh, doing things the conventional way. I didn't go too far from the conventional way early on, but eventually um, I totally started doing the beating heart surgery. And since then, it's been a huge part of my practice. The patients come from all over because they want to have it. Um, in fact, probably in the last five years, 57% of all bypass surgery done at my institution is done robotically. Oh, that's extraordinary. Yeah, 57. So does that mean you, you must be really leading the way in hybrid revascularization? Yes, probably. Yeah. Yes, leading the way would be a, an understatement. Yeah, which for those who don't understand is really combining the best of surgery and the catheter options that cardiologists are able to offer. Stents, in other words, which is what most people view them as, where you as the surgeon provide the most important bypass, which is that mammary artery to the front of the heart, the LAD. Right. And then everything else is dealt with. Yep by other means, and the patient recovers quickly, and uh, it's quite it's remarkable. The, it's the best of both worlds. Yeah. The best of the surgery world and the best of what they can do with stents. Yeah. The biggest difference is what we do with surgery gives you a survival benefit because we go to the most important artery in the heart with the best, the most important bypass graft. And then the rest of the lesions that the heart may have can be fixed can be fixed, but not all. It depends on whether it's a proper lesion to fix. You know, they can fix like these very awful lesions on somebody that's not doing well. 
the, they can push the envelope a little bit and put in multiple stents. But generally, when we do a hybrid, it's got to be an optimal lesion for a stent, so the stent is most successful. And so far, we figured it out for the most part. Well, the other thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that we've discovered in the last few years, last 10 years in particular, with the results of various trials that have come out, like the Freedom Trial and and uh, and others, Courage was a, was a good one, that not everything needs to be treated. Yes. You, know, you treat the main things and uh, control symptoms, and they live just as long. That's a good point. The thing is, is that we have found that when we do this one very important left internal thoracic artery to the anterior descending artery, which is the most important bypass, sometimes because the patient is so sick that we don't, we don't do any stents. We don't do a lot of things because we don't want to upset the equilibrium of the patient. But... Um, in that scenario, when we just treat the one important artery, it's amazing how many patients do great thereafter without any chest pain, without any heart fare, without anything. So, but, we're, you know, for the last, what is it, 70 years, 70 years, we have to treat anything more than 50% as traditionally. And then the cardiologists push it a little bit more. Well, maybe 70% lesion should be fixed. And then, and then... They want to have every little artery on the heart bypass. I do have to say I did nine bypasses on one patient. Oh, no. They were all big arteries, and the guy did great. But uh, <laughs> I don't think I wanted to hear that. <laughs> no. <laughs> but he did great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things I've always admired about you is the methodical way in which you've approached it. I remember when I first started to hear you speak about this particular uh, gift that you have, really. It was giving advice about how you can get started. And I was so struck by the simplicity of your approach. I would never have thought about this. Do a sternotomy and use the robot to take down the mammary through a sternotomy when you start. That's how you'll get comfortable with the robot. What a great idea, because if anything went wrong, you could easily fix it and move on. Right. And then on to the next step and on to the next step. You've always taken this very methodical approach, which I think is a reflection of the fact that you were such a high-level athlete. You probably had to approach training in such a way. You probably enjoyed practice. I did. Uh, like, take golf, for example. All the best golfers enjoy practice. Um, and I think you have to. The best musicians enjoy practice. Uh, but not everybody does. Not everybody's like you. And you have all these young men and women that are coming into, uh, into our specialty who look up to you, as they, uh, as they should. And, um, but they don't have that particular sort of set of uh, motivations that come naturally to you. So how do you, what do you say to them? Somehow they need to embrace what I call the incremental learning. You're doing a little bit at a time. Yeah. And if they want to be successful, it's as easy as doing incremental learning, a little bit at a time. Um, and then after that, there's going to be little time. There's going to be sometimes that all of a sudden they're going to have these successes, the aha moment that they're going to have. Wow, I can do this. And then all of a sudden they'll get more inspired. Like coming to this meeting, it's inspiring. It's inspiring to hear how everybody is like, they're trying to do things a little bit better all the time, a little less invasive. And, um, it's inspired me to do more work. I know. We were just talking about it. <laughs> you can teach an old dog new tricks, yes. I suppose. <laughs> Didn't mean to call you an old dog. But, I am, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're both getting there, you know. No one's immortal, but uh, you certainly no. seem like it, no. you know. Um, what else do you like to do outside work? I mean, what, what, what keeps you alive other than work? 
I like to work out. Yeah. My ideal day would be to get plenty of sleep <laughs> and then work out for four hours. Yeah. At, at my age, I have to warm up for like two hours before I do anything. Yeah. Uh, extraneous, but I just enjoy the exhilaration of having a good workout. Yeah. It's and, a very selfish pleasure, but it's, yeah. it's an okay selfish yes. pleasure. Yes. <laughs> because it does give you that. Uh, yeah, you love it. Yeah. You love it. Prepares you for things. So rowing, biking, yeah. surfing. I'm getting a little bit slow getting up on my surfboard, but I get on my paddleboard and I can get on the waves, and that's yeah. Uh, yeah. nice. Yeah. Amazing. Things that I enjoy. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And you've been in Philly for how long now? At, uh, at Lankanaw. At Lankanaw? Yeah. Uh, 40 years. Four years. <laughs> 40 years? 40. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. I had to be old then. <laughs> well, I mean, I arrived here in uh, 1988, so I've been here 37 years uh, on this street, Fannin. So that's pretty... Well, I did have a break in my 40 years. And I... So I was at Lankanaw for a few years... And then I took took a couple years off and came back in eighty nine. So it's like thirty seven years. Yeah. So let's look ahead to the future because the younger people that are here at the conference, they want to learn the the latest and best of what's happening now, but they also want to be given some sort of uh, insight as to what's coming down the line. And I guess people with experience in the field are best able to provide that kind of insight. So let's take the field of coronary surgery, for example, which is yours. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about your thoughts in the area of valvular surgery as well. Ten years from now, let's take coronary surgery. Ten years from now, coronary artery disease, excuse me. What do you see? I see that the I, the good thing, stents just are getting better and better and better and better and better. They can still get better, but compared to what they were 10 years ago, that they are amazing now. That's why the hybrid procedure just fits right now because we can do the mammary to the anterior descending artery and they can do their stents are better. Their ability to do stents are better. It's a good marriage right now. In 10 years, there's always, there's always going to be patients that have the worst coronary disease that you can't even think of doing a stent. You know, and in the future, probably there's going to be better medicine. Yeah. For certainly there's going to be better stents. Yeah. But I still think there's going to be surgery. Yeah. And... Um, I think that the bypass surgery would be is 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 going to be great. Um, it's one it's, of yeah. You know, it's hard to imagine, as I think you probably feel the same way. It's hard to imagine that it's going to be easy to improve on the liter to the LAD. There, well, it is. Unfortunately, years ago, two thousand and eight. <laughs> We had, we had the best technology. It was made my head spin because we had a stapling device to attach the grafts to the heart arteries that the ones that I saw, the ones that I were involved in, they did great because for the most part, you know, you, they just give you a perfect anastomosis. And, you know, you could do everything with the robot. We had stabilizing devices, and all that went off the market. Went off the market because not enough guys, surgeons, were using it, which is a sad thing. But I understand that, you know, the companies need to make some money to support their research. But um, I am seeing that that's going to come back, and I think we're going to be able to do more with less trauma. Right now, we do minimal trauma doing the operation that we have, but it's going to become more sophisticated with stapling devices and less of an incision on the patient. Everything's going to be better. 
There's new robots, of course, as we heard, yeah. especially the one that Dr. Srivastava is developing, which is has its focus on on cardiac surgery. And I, my understanding is that they have adopted the stapling technology, and hopefully that will become more widely available. I hope so. Yeah. In fact, I almost like... I want to go to India, go see Sadir. Yeah, yeah. He's such a wonderful guy. Yeah, yeah, he is. I think that the valve surgery, I think that's going to go the other way. I think the surgeons are going to be doing less work uh, unless they're totally involved because, you know, sometimes they put the, the aortic valves in the mitral position. Uh, they work fine. Yes. They're certainly doing well with the aortic valves. Um, I... I I would be fearful yes. if I was just a mitral surgeon. Yes, yes. I think that's a reasonable uh, concern that surgeons should have. Um, either get into the transcatheter space uh, if you're a young surgeon, um, or for sure learn how to do properly minimally invasive uh, uh, treatment of coronary artery disease. Right, yeah. right. Well, Frank, I, uh, Fran, I know that you um, and I will both be watching the Oxford Cambridge boat race on yes Sunday, this thirteenth, and um, I just wanted you to know what I really feel, and that is, when I grow up, I want to be like you, <laughs> and I want to be like you. You're you're like trying to teach the world here the best way to do cardiac surgery. Yeah, well. I'm I'm corralling people like you who know how to do that. I'm not doing it myself. Thank you very much, Ed. You're welcome.